Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections. We are talking today about what's going on in Brazil as a reflection of what happened on January 6th and possibly as a, an example of what might happen again in the United States and elsewhere. Um, and for our, this discussion, we're going we're gonna to speak to Carlos Juarez, who's uh, at the East-West Center and who is very familiar with Latin America. Carlos Juarez, thank you so much for joining us on this very important news story. I think we have to know about it. I think it does affect the United States. And it has, um, you know, a, a, an echo chamber with what is going on, what has gone on in Washington. Because, you know, some people say our insurrection is not quite over. Our insurrection took place last week in the election of Kevin McCarthy. And so, um, you know, insurrections are all the rage these days, aren't they? Tell us what happened in Brazil. Well, welcome, Jay. Always a pleasure and uh, delighted to reconnect with you. And in this case, put on my Latin Americanist hat, you know, as a longtime observer and, and longtime resident as well and specialist in, in the region. Uh, and it does matter, as you mentioned. I mean, Brazil is, of course, a very important player regionally, of course, the largest Latin American country, population, economy. But it is a global leader as well, as you well know, part of the BRICS uh, years ago, together with, you know, Russia, India, uh, China and so on. Uh, and it was particularly at that time, about 10 years ago, under the new now returning President Lula, that Brazil sort of was very prominent. Well, what happened in this last weekend, quite dramatic. We saw a, a massive crowds in Brasilia, the capital, uh, walking up to the ramps of the congressional buildings, uh, the, taking over the, you know, the the the, 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 the House of Congress chambers, uh, the Supreme Court. I mean, just a ghastly and, and a lot of destruction. And of course, uh, very much parallels what we saw literally two years ago in, in Washington, D.C. That is, uh, it is as a result of the outcome of a recent election Brazil held at the end of October. Uh, and uh, those uh, basically protesting our supporters, uh, hardcore supporters of the ex-president, the outgoing president, uh, who did not win re-election. So it got ugly. It's still a work in progress and uh, comes curiously at a time when our own president, Joe Biden, happens to be in Latin America, a very rare uh, first time opportunity. He's traveled now to Mexico City, meeting with uh, the Mexican President AMLO and uh, Canada's Prime Minister. They're having a tri trilateral meeting, uh, very important. And so interesting, all three of them issued a very important statement condemning the violence, supporting the president, and so on. But, uh, you know, the issue is complex. It has a lot of interesting parallels on the one hand, some interesting differences, uh, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out and, and how whether, you know, the response of the Brazilian government, this new incoming government, is going to be quick, decisive, uh, but it also underscores we see a very polarized society in Brazil, uh, very much uh, this outgoing president, a right wing, uh, you know, sort of uh, leader who uh, very much uh, had ties to the military himself, a military leader. Keep in mind, Brazil uh, has a very important military in its past history, a political military. That is, uh, they ran the country from, you know, the late 60s through the mid uh, 80s for about 20 years as a military regime. So when we speak of the military in Brazil, it's not just abstract. I mean, it's, a uh, you know, and, and in people's mind, there are both memories of it. And, and even today, you know, fears of what, what, you know, would the military, you know, support him or not? So far, it looks as if they have not, although clearly there are allies and supporters. Moreover, this could not have happened without some pretty clear, you know, support and let's say acquiescence uh, from a lot of security forces, intelligence agencies as well. So it's a complex mess, but uh, boy, we're looking at it unravel. And, uh, and you know, again, the parallels with the U.S. and what happened here two years ago, you know, the uh, insurrection, as you noted, uh, of our own capital. Uh, is this something that's going to now become the new norm in fledgling democracies? Uh, interesting topics, but yeah, uh, uh, and uh, I'm struck also with, you know, we, we real quick thought is that, you know, with, for the U.S., we saw this as clearly what it was, a very blight to our democracy, you know, long heralded as, as you know, the beacon of democracy. Now the U.S. is wounded from that and the world sees that. What I want to suggest is that Brazil it remains to be seen. But it is a fledgling democracy. It's, you know, it doesn't have, let's say, the long record of the U.S. So it is on one hand a little bit more tenuous. But I want to suggest that it's very possible that the institutions will prevail and then Brazil may come out of this even stronger in, in, in a paradox in that sense that a weaker, maybe newer democracy gets challenged. Maybe it will prove uh, something that can strengthen it. Uh, again, I'm just speculating there. Whereas for the U.S., I think we're still figuring out, you know, what the result is of our own insurrection and, and even the drama that played out last week. You know, some would say it's democracy, which is messy, but others would say it's also, you know, at the end, it's not really about policy. It's just this petty, ugly, personality-driven uh, polarization, let's say. You no, know, um, 
I, I, I don't know enough about this, but maybe you can help me. Um, so in this country, it was all based on, you know, the election was stolen. Trump's, uh, you know, Trump's up big lie. Um, and so that was a, sort of a, a justification, a rationale of, um, you know, a lot of people who were at the insurrection and who otherwise uh, take the position that the election was stolen in so many ways. Um, query, what was the rationaliza rationalization, if any, uh, for the attack on the government in, in, in Brasilia? Um, was it similar? Was it something like the election was stolen? Some kind of euphemistic rationalization? I mean, definitely very much similar in, in, in the sense that it followed many months of, uh, of very incendiary remarks from, from Bolsonaro. That is, the, the election occurred at the end of October, even leading up to it, like Trump. He was already, you know, addressing, you know, fake news and questioning the legitimacy of, of you know, uh, either rigged, uh, you know, elections and the like. So some of it is definitely that. And, and that makes very clear a comparison. Uh, that is, that both leaders employed very similar playbooks here. But during and after the electoral defeats, uh, they, leading to concerns in both countries about how robust the electoral processes and the democratic institutions would hold up. So again, Bolsonaro complained vehemently about fake news, uh, insisting that the polling that was used was rigged, etc. Uh, you know, it, Trump himself, interesting about the insurrection, again, some parallels and differences. Uh, Trump basically spoke directly to his supporters hours before, you recall, and we've heard a lot of that evidence, and then he remained in his residence. Uh, interestingly, Bolsonaro, of course, is gone. He left uh, shortly uh, before the inauguration to Florida, and he's been in the United States. So very curious how, in some ways, that gives him almost like a plausible, you know, well, I wasn't there, I wasn't behind it. And yet, uh, you know, the other part is like, will he be, you know, uh, extradited back if, if the Brazilian government chooses to, you know, push forward and, and as they could? He's facing a lot of, uh, you know, similar to Trump, a lot of different court, uh, uh, again, you know, issue, uh, uh, not court, I'm sorry. He, he's basically being investigated for at least, you know, four different criminal probes himself. Uh, all four of these investigations are led by the Supreme Court Justice, who's had a prominent role in this crisis right now. Uh, and of course, who uh, Bolsonaro's critics are saying is trying to silence free speech. So it's, you know, it's an ugly debate going back and forth. Uh, but the point is, even his presence in the U.S. now, uh, for some, it might be seen as a way to try to get away from it or what. Uh, and 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 yet, uh, you know, he could also see fresh investigations that are following because he's no longer a president. He doesn't have the protections of a, you know, a sitting president. Uh, and the U.S., uh, you know, could extradite him if, if it was uh, if it was presented. So that, that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Well, I, I really take your point about deniability. I mean, it's like he learned from the select committee in this country. He learned not to be around, not to be directly involved, be, yeah. be in Florida, uh, where you can yeah. say, Gee, I didn't have anything to do with this. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a great defense. On the mm -hmm. other hand, you know, uh, maybe you can speak to how easy it is to communicate from the United States to any Latin American uh, country. I mean, if he was a co-conspirator, uh, if some of his acolytes were, you know, uh, organizing this protest, riot, disturbance, what have you, um, he could do that so easily from Florida, right? Just pick up the phone, right? Absolutely. And, and of course, again, we're going to be looking carefully uh, in, in the days ahead, weeks ahead uh, of how carefully they're going to be investigating this because the bottom line is that clearly uh you know commanders from the military the police uh and even the defense ministry are likely to be held accountable in court if you know there there, there were for, for many weeks there were camps that were set up outside of many military bases which are these protesters and they were like egging on the military leaders to sort of you know step forward and and you know essentially foster a military coup. Uh, and so now you've got, and again, it's very heavily polarized because now you put the attorney general and the Supreme Court are more in favor of Lula. At this point, they were adversaries, uh, but now they've got a, a, a new administration that's supportive. Moreover, looking at just the destruction, and I've been reading and, and, and some of have seen the vivid the videos, I mean, it is ghastly. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how you can compare it to what was done with the Capitol, it's more than just the Capitol. It's the Supreme Court, it's the Congress, it's, you know, the executive branch. So uh, and there were and 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 the stories I'm seeing, they were like almost like an apocalyptic, you know, zombie people walking around, you know. And and then there's a funny picture that came out. Uh, well, I say funny because in the middle of all this, a guy selling like uh, cotton candy in the middle of all this. Uh, <laughs> uh, moreover, very interesting. Many of the protesters dressed in the you know traditional Brazilian soccer team colors, yellow and and red. The soccer federation quickly put out a notice saying, no, we do not, you know, support this. This you know reflects poorly on us. So uh, again, it's a 
uh, quite a drama that's playing out. Uh, but going back to Brazil as, as a country, I mean, it, here you've also had world leaders from everywhere, right? even from Russia, from Turkey, uh, you know, Europe, everywhere, very much supporting Lula and in, in, in defending, you know, uh, this. Uh, but, uh, you know, go back back to Brazil, its role. I mean, uh, under Bolsonaro, the, the president who's outgoing, I mean, he was not a particularly, uh, um, uh, you know, let's say, globally oriented. To the extent he was, it was usually with other autocrats, like the Turkish leader, maybe the Russian leader, and so on. Both, uh, Lula, by contrast, he was president before for eight years, uh, about 10 years ago, and very much uh, very, at the time, he played a very prominent role in foreign policy uh, on a regional level in Latin America, but also broadly, uh, the so-called BRICS, uh, the, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa group that came about, you know, in these recent years, uh, as part of a global trade and environmental negotiations. And so, when he was president before, he was considered one of the most popular politicians, certainly in the history of Brazil, also controversial, but also popular in the world uh, among leaders. Now, having said that, his term was also marked by many scandals. And let's be very, let's remind you, he spent 580 days in jail. That is Lula, the new president, literally was in prison for corruption uh, and, and scandals and then eventually technicalities. And, you know, so depending and on where you two years that's yes, two years practically ago. almost two years and he was released uh he tried to run in 2018 but again for a legal reason uh he couldn't qualify he got that cleared up he came back and won but what i want to say here though certainly a population uh that is divided some of them see him as a corrupt you know uh you know indicted you know criminal and and otherwise maybe they abhor his politics you know on the left etc there's a strong strong element of, of brazilian you know again uh po political elite that that they focus on stability. They even have a yearning for the nostalgia of the of the military, you know, rule days, et cetera. Uh, so it's uh, yeah, it's interesting to see uh, how this is going to both show us Brazil and 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 it's you know it's a very colorful society, and and I mean that in the sense of you know it's a very rich, diverse one, and uh, you know its democracy, while relatively young, is also you know rather at times raucous and 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 um, bumpy, uh, and even in these last ten years when when Bolsonaro came to office. I mean, some of the campaigning, he got shot during one of them. And as we speak now, I just read in the last hour that uh, there are reports that he might be in a in a Florida hospital that have not been confirmed. So it's just, you know, it's kind of like almost like a soap opera that's playing out in its own way. But back to your main point, I mean, clearly anybody anywhere has got, you know, through social media, through, you know, text and, and, and other, you know, technologies, an ability to do, you know, what you do wherever you are. It doesn't matter, right? So the real question is, you know, how much and and at the end of the day, it's not like he's giving direct orders. He's got supporters that are clearly behind this. But I think what's becoming clear is that this was not something that just came out of nowhere. Uh, it was clearly a pretty broad based and, and, and there were a lot of people involved in bringing this about. So it's likely to lead. Uh, and already we've seen, I think, a couple hundred arrests yesterday, another twelve hundred arrests today. So it's going to be interesting to see. Will, will the violence be contained? Will it go through essentially a process where, you know, this will gradually become more in the courts and and, and played out that way in this country, uh, again, going through its own struggles with, you know, relatively new institutions. Uh, and if you look at Brasilia, I mean, this is a country that didn't have a city in Brasilia until the mid 60s. They literally created that city out of nowhere. And so it's a very modern democracy, modern capital, modern uh, infrastructure today that has been destroyed and ransacked. And wow, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'll be interested to see when they do the final count uh, what damage was done, because it looks pretty broad and, and widespread. Yeah, it's not that big a city. This is a, the city that Daniel K. Ludwig built, an American, and put all kinds of money into it in the 60s. So, yeah, that's, I remember that. Mm, yeah. uh, but it's not that big in terms of the population. And you mm. wonder... Um, how many of these protesters came from Rio and other places in Brazil oh. to join the crowd? From all around. And again, very orchestrated buses. And, and, and you know, this was not just something that just spontaneously out of nowhere. It's clearly very well coordinated. And as I mentioned earlier, they were that many of them were camped out at military bases throughout the country, uh, essentially as supporters of the military. And uh, so, yeah, it's going to begin to unravel a lot more of the really the pretty comprehensive uh, protest movement that just didn't you know didn't spark spontaneously but seems to have had a pretty coordinated effort well yeah i want to i want to go back to uh, the point about uh, the uh, action of of the government under lula um they did arrest hundreds of people uh, and that it strikes me is that's another lesson they learned from the united states you don't wait two years we didn't do a very good job they went right out there immediately 
and arrested hundreds of people and uh, are taking action against them. And I guess that had to be done with Lula's uh, support or instruction. Yeah. Um, and it's 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 pretty dramatic. Yeah. Um, you think it'll have the necessary political effect or is it just going to stir things up all the more? You know, again, and, and part of the delicate nature is that it, the, the history of, of of Brazil, like a lot of South American countries, where the military has stepped in to take over through military governments, uh, literally in the beginning in the in Brazil in 1964, and then continuing throughout South America. You know, Uruguay, uh, Argentina, Chile, you know, Peru. Military governments were the rule of the day uh, in the late 60s, throughout the 70s, not until really the mid 80s. And why I say that is because, again, the, the military as an institution in, in Latin America is a very political organization and they have run governments. And while they did leave office discredited in the, you know, the mid 80s, uh, there were always those who felt that it was unfair and uneven and that since then, the political leaders have taken the country, let's say, in the wrong direction for, for many, uh, particularly those who, well, uh, who, who have different reasons to support it. But maybe getting to your key point there is that what's going to play out now, and I, I want to say the early indications seem to be that President Lula does have the support of the key military police. Now, uh, all of them, that's the challenge. And, and when you begin to kind of go in, and, and, and it's one thing to arrest protesters on the scene making violence. But what's going to happen in terms of our, our commanders from the military, the police and the defense ministry held accountable in courts? Uh, and, and, and then it's, you know, how they're treated. Uh, now, again, if it's a open, transparent process, it should play out in a way where, hey, uh, if, they're, if they're convicted of, of having been behind some of this activity. Uh, but it remains to be seen. Uh, I I'm cautiously optimistic that it should be, you know, playing out in that way, because I think Lula has a lot more both legitimacy himself, you know, uh, as, as the elected leader. Uh, by that, I mean that the, the election itself was not called into question in the same way, even though Bolsonaro supporters may question it, they don't they don't have any real teeth behind it. And by and large, uh, there's a strong commitment among the institutions and, and let's say the polity at large. Uh, but boy, again, you know, just to you can't uh, discount the possibility that there may be some disgruntled, you know, officers or people who just really, you know, but how 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 can that play out? I, I don't think we're going to see the kind of military coups of the past. More often what we see are merely, you know, maybe autocrats like Bolsonaro, maybe like Obrador today in Mexico, who is militarizing the country using democratic institutions. It's a new style of authoritarian rule where, again, civilian leaders are using authoritarian tactics, techniques and so on. Um, uh, but I would say, again, right now, it looks as though uh, certainly the country is 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 going to stay, you know, intact. And, and by that, I mean that the, the president has support of the key security personnel and 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 needs that. And a very important, uh, the, the courts, uh, the Supreme Court, which, like the U.S., has always been uh, rather independent in, in Brazil. Uh, it also, uh, you know, it also is trying to kind of, you know, ensure its place, uh, that it's a key part of, of, of the process. Uh, and uh, so that's that's going to be playing out there. So, again, uh, it, it's it's a work in progress. But, uh, boy, uh, you can't help but see the clear parallels. The fact that Bolsonaro and Trump, you know, were very close personal and are close personal friends and allies. Um, curious that he's in Florida now. I mean, just to add a, a little more to that. Well, uh, there was a report on uh, National Public Radio this morning that uh, Bolsonaro has been meeting with some of Trump's acolytes, mm -hmm. um, which is very disturbing to me uh, um, because it means that Trump is uh, supporting him with whatever influence he might have. I, I don't know what influence that might be. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from what happened on January 6th. And it could be that Trump is advising and counseling him and um, encouraging him. Um, to repeat a big lie and go back and try to, um, you know, get back into power. Uh, this yep. is this is disturbing because it means that the same kind of sickness that Trump has visited on the United States uh, will will then be a factor in how things play out in Brazil. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah, again, uh, it, it, it is interesting. But again, I would say right now, the the you know. He, uh, the, the international response is what I'm getting. Uh, you know, overall, it's been, you know, wanting to support this new leader and president. But, um, boy, uh, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, it's going to play out internally uh, and, and and they have to handle this domestically. But I go back to, you know, what I was saying earlier, that in the case of Brazil, you basically got 
uh, like the U.S., the judiciary is independent. But in the past, many presidents have in practice, they've been able to put pressure on a lot of criminal probes. Well, today, uh, the federal police, which is already investigating Bolsonaro, is also run now by a Lula ally. So, uh, you know, but again, th that either facilitates moving forward with this or those maybe the hardcore supporters of Bolsonaro would see this as just, you know, clearly more of a conspiracy all out to get him, et cetera. But, uh, you know, if, if, if yeah, I mean, clearly it, democracy should not have people storming and, and, and you know, trashing the institution. So this this has to be seen for what it is, a violent uh, attack. And, 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 you know, people have to be found. Yeah, and on, on a culpable. bunch of government buildings, on a number of government buildings, more than just the legislature. Yeah, 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 it yeah. went after the Supreme Court. Of yeah, the, that's the right. Council. Yeah. So one, one thing that, uh, you know, you and I have discussed over the years, which I, I take away from our discussions as a sort of general rule, is that the United States is very important to Latin America. You know, you talk to anybody who is, uh, you know, in Latin America or any official uh, in a leadership position or in trade, and they will say that what the United States does and says is very important, very influential. So I guess, um, you know, one of the factors that I would see in how this plays out is what, you know, our legitimate government has to say about it. In other words, Joe Biden's in Mexico. This is all over the press now for a couple, three days. Um, and he could say we support uh, Lula as the legitimate president. Uh, we think it's very important that democracy, uh, you know, be uh, preserved and protected in Brazil. And they are, you know, our 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 kissing cousin, um, and, you know, just generally take a position on things. I, I guess he's been friendly to Lula over the past few months, but query, has he? And it, has he said anything now? Public statements by American presidents have a huge effect, don't they? Yeah. Well, no, absolutely. And, and your main point, interesting how you put it, that the United States is very important for Latin America. It's, the, you know, the, for many of these countries, often the leading, you know, ex, you know export market and import, et cetera, uh, large diaspora communities, even of Brazilians today in South Florida and New York, everywhere else, uh, business interests, clearly. But, um, you know, the other challenge, I guess, is, uh, uh, well, it, at the end of the day, I mean, uh, right now, because Biden is in Mexico, that's the framing, you know, the main discussion. So he's, he's they're issuing a statement in concert, you know, the Canadian and, and, and Mexican leaders. But, you know, you fast forward on another week or two, and I guess part of me wants to get at this. I think it's fair to say that under Bolsonaro, when Trump was in office, they had a, you know, they were best friends. Uh, and yet the relationship was kind of, uh, I don't know how she was, shall we say, it was it wasn't like sour or bad, but it wasn't particularly engaging, maybe to put it that way, if you can say that. Um, what I would suspect under Lula now, it's likely that Brazil will re-engage more globally and connect more as he did before. He had a, he's a very active foreign policy president. He sees Brazil as a leader in, in a way that, you know, he wants to represent that other world, the G20, the, the old third world. Um, and beyond that, I would say that for the U.S., it, it's probably... Or I mean, let me rephrase that for the new Biden administration, Bo, uh, Lula is is a partner that, you know, there's a lot more things in common in terms of shared interests right now, both dealing with the aftermath of, of you know, of, of, of the insurrections. But more to the point that I could see well, uh, Lula coming to Washington in the next few months. Uh, I'm not sure that Biden is too keen on going to Brazil. He's doing this right now because of the importance of this, you know, more regional summit with Mexico. But all that to say, I think, you know, U.S.-Brazil relations are likely to continue to be improving, uh, if we can say that, because certainly under Bolsonaro, they were tense, uh, you know, with, with Biden and they've gotten better. Beyond that, I don't know. I mean, uh, Brazil is, is, is in some ways its own unique large animal that it, it's not dependent on the U.S. for either its legitimacy or it, it, while it is important, Brazil sees itself important to Africa. It exports a lot of machinery and goods that way to Europe. You know, it's kind of like a gateway for Latin America. So, I mean, all that to say, Brazil does have this view. We often use the word in, in, in Portuguese, it's grandeza, which is the same in Spanish, greatness. It has a, almost like a, 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 you know, not delusions, but visions of grandeur of sorts. You know, it sees itself as a big player in everything it does. Uh, kind of like, you know, we often refer to Texas. Everything is big and larger. Brazil has a little bit of that. It's a large country and 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 uh, uh, and has a lot of pride in that. And again, under a leader like Lula, again, more willingness to engage, not so much under Bolsonaro. He was kind of, you know, kind of stay at home and, and always controversial and contentious uh, 
Well, uh, but let, let me just say again, with the relations with the U.S., again, they're important, they're complex, but mm, I would say, whereas the U.S. is very important to, 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 to Latin America, while we can show statistically and in many ways the Latin America is important to the U.S., it's never quite at the top of the foreign policy agenda. It's Russia, Ukraine, China, you know, uh, whatever latest hotspot is there. And oh, yeah, Latin America. But bottom line is post 9-11, uh, the last 20 years, Latin America has been neglected by the U.S. foreign policy areas for different reasons. Uh, I think, unfortunately, because, again, it's our main trading partner, it's our main immigration source, it's uh, it's our border. Uh, and today, that Mexican border is not just Mexicans, as we know, there's Central Americans, South Americans, you know, Haitians, Africans, uh, and even some Brazilians thrown in there. They're not, you know, the main face of it. But I can assure you, those border towns that are full of migrants lately, they're coming from everywhere. And it's, it's yeah, it's interesting. Problem for Biden. And, yeah. um, you know, Biden's got a problem at the border and south of the border. And uh, B- Biden has a problem, you know, I think with Brazil in the sense that Brazil now is testing its democracy. Um, and if uh, Brazil fails in that democracy, Biden doesn't look so good. And uh, we know that Donald Trump uh, likes chaos. He likes to create chaos as a way to enhancing his own power. And that is very important to him now because he's trying to make his comeback for 2024. So I I offer you this theory and see what you think. And Trump would like nothing more than to see the chaos continue and exacerbate in Brasilia and around Brazil. Uh, He would be in favor of that. And he would have a a good listener at the ear of Bolsonaro, wouldn't he? Um, And so if he could shake things up further, if he could create more chaos, he could criticize Biden for not being able to handle that chaos at our southern, you know, Latin American continent. Um, and he could use it to enhance his political position um, on the next presidential run. What, what do you think? Mm. Well, it, it's a tough one. I mean, uh, part of me is thinking, how can someone like Trump benefit from this? Because like showcasing Brazil, you're not going to give credit to the protesters. And unless you condemn it, you're effectively doing that. I don't know. I'm hard pressed to think that. I, I think that as this fades away rather quickly, by next week, we'll be on to the next hot thing. Uh, I don't know that Trump's going to get a lot out of this. Uh, but having said that, I think Bolsonaro, like Trump, would probably like to see and foster, you know, continued chaos and, and benefits from that and would like to see the institutions dysfunctional because at the end of the day, they're going to be calling on him. Those those courts are going to call him back. And we may see the U.S. federal marshals putting him on a plane back to Brasilia. Mm. Uh, so I th- I think that's more likely. That's my theory. But I may be wrong. Uh, well, I mean, he, yeah, his first um, order of business is to stay out of jail, I suppose. And, um, you know, that <laughs> deniability in Florida is very important. So one more one more area I'd like to mm-hmm. ask you about, Carlos, and that's yeah. this. You know, you and I have talked often about, you know, the aspirational possibility that Latin America could become a continent, um, that there there could be leadership there. And and part of the reason there isn't, in my opinion anyway, is that the United States, uh, since the Monroe Doctrine, has not done a good job, uh, you know, in in, in dealing with the possibility of encouraging Latin American countries to work together, to collaborate and so forth. Okay, and so right now we have a crisis of democracy in Brazil. We, I suppose, I'm not, I'm not sure the exact status of it, but we've had a crisis of democracy in what uh, Venezuela as well, and maybe in other countries too, in one degree or another. Um, so my question to you is: All of the Latin American countries, uh, although they don't speak Portuguese, they they speak Latin American, you know what I mean? Uh, and they're very interested in what happens in every other Latin American country. Uh, how do these events and possibilities in Brazil affect other Latin American countries, those that are stable and those that are not so stable? Yeah, no, I think that's a key point because this is the age of social media where instantly you know what's happening. Uh, you know, what, a month ago we saw drama playing out in Peru. They had a coup in a day and then just chaos and so on. And these are not insignificant because I, I'm thinking back, you know, in the history of Latin America, I spoke briefly about, you know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, these military, those were days where you literally had to wait for the newspaper to arrive. And, you know, you just didn't, it, it was different. Now it's instant. Now, having said that, I would also say that there is today a growing uh, almost uh, uh, interdependence and, and maybe similar, not quite the same level, but like in Europe, this integration that has happened so that today, 
young professional Chileans and Argentinians and Brazilians uh, are increasingly, you know, uh, having a shared identity, uh, not at the level of the European Union by any means, but regionally it is increasingly. Maybe Uruguay and, and Argentina, Chile and Argentina, et cetera. Mexico, to some extent, with the Central American neighbors. So this is the reality of globalization, global forces. We're more connected. We 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 know more of what's happening. Not to mention, look at Mexico. We mentioned all these immigrants. Suddenly, Mexico is dealing with immigrants from every place that wasn't the reality even 10, 20 years ago. So uh, they've got to, you know, they've got to understand that suddenly they're no longer this, you know, you in the independent country. So all of this to say, gosh, it just underscores the interdependence of the world. And I would say Latin America will never quite reach that sort of uh, integration of, of the European because there are important differences among them. And I don't know, the socialization... But I see it changing among the younger ones. Uh, much like today, we speak of maybe a European identity. You know, if you're a young Portuguese or a Slovenian or a Danish, you've got more in common than you realize, maybe than your grandparents did, right? The same with Latin America. Today, there's a growing middle class, a growing, you know, interconnected, especially global youth. And when they see these things play out, you can't help but realize that it's shaping their worldview and, and maybe helping to define, I don't know, you know, what is democracy? It's messy, it's ugly, but it also needs to be vigilant you have to be vigilant protecting it etc so i don't know just some random thoughts there but I, I like how you framed it because at the end of the day latin america like other parts of the world you could say similar things about africa parts of asia southeast asia maybe where there's this growing mobility of people of ideas of connections and so we no longer speak of these like brazil is not just there by itself it's a regional player it's a global actor and what happens there is going to shape and impact other places everywhere and not just in latin america i could imagine in the streets of jakarta or seoul or wherever else people are singing this and going whoa this is a real test of of what it means to be a democracy well uh taking it one step further i'm sure if if uh, we went um and talked to some of the people who are protesting uh in brasilia um uh, they would be mm, politically awake politically awakened mm -hmm. and they would believe that uh, bolsonaro was the better choice uh, they would believe, you know, the big lie about who won that election and so forth. But they would care. They would care. They would be young, too. A lot of them would be young. And so what, what, that, what that leads me to ask you is this. Um, you know, could what happens, what, hap what has happened and what will happen in Brazil um, affect the stability of other Latin American countries? Will it foment the same kind of mm, political contention Elsewhere, because some of those places are vulnerable to these these, these contentions, don't you think? Yeah. And so there's a dark side to it, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. And 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 the reality, I would say, is Brazil. I think has shown us that even though it's a newer democracy, I believe, and I, I have this cautious optimism, it's going to come through and probably strengthen its democracy. Maybe I'm hopeful. What I want to say is that there are other countries not quite as fortunate, uh, particularly some of the Central American countries. They don't have let's say, a history of, of stronger institutions and uh, and their civil society is not as, let's say, organized. Uh, and similar, a few other countries in South America that are a little bit less, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, consolidated, let's say. So, yeah, there is that risk. Uh, and yet, having said that, there's also the other side that maybe this can show us that, yeah, there, there's a price to be paid. We have to be careful. You have to be more vigilant. You have to try to you know learn from this to avoid it from happening. Uh, and yet, again, easier said than done. Well, hopefully, mm, America can send a message supporting Lula and democracy, and that would have an effect, uh, hopefully, even though it's not you know a direct effect necessarily. Uh, and and take steps, perhaps as it should have been taking in years past, um, to uh, you know bring Latin America to a better place. I hope so. I know I know you do too. Uh, thank you for joining me on this discussion, Carlos. It's very important that we follow what's going on. They are our neighbors. They, they are our cousins anyway. Absolutely. And what happens there, you know, ultimately has an effect on our lives here. Thank you so much, Carlos. Thank you, Jay. Always a pleasure. And let me just add that even though it's small, we have a Brazilian diaspora here in Hawaii that's a longstanding uh, in different areas, business, but also even the surf community, no doubt. Uh, so we've got, again, a connection here we don't always realize, but as far away from Brazil, we have a piece of it here, too. Yeah. And there's the Brazilian connection on Hawaii Public Radio. Where that's the... right. We get some great music again. And then the popular culture, it's all there. Yes. <laughs> it's all there. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you, Carlos. I hope to see you again. Happy New Year. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.